Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Hope everybody's doing well today. Got folks joining on. Good morning, Lyle, <clears throat> Gail, Jean, Wayne. Good to see everybody joining on today. Hope you have, uh, have your Bible. And we're going to be, good morning, Connie, in Matthew chapter 12 today. Matthew chapter 12, Roger and Anita from Ohio. Good to see you guys on here today. Matthew chapter 12. So I posted something on our public Facebook page yesterday. Obviously, we're working our way through Matthew's gospel. We're in chapter 12, and we'll see how far we get today. It's 50 verses. There's a lot here. Um, but beginning in Matthew chapter 13, we have the uh, parables. Good morning, Linda. We have the parables of Jesus. Now, I just did a series of 20 videos on all the parables of Jesus. Um, so I'm not going to go back over those. I mean, this is just, I don't know, a month or two ago. I did the, I went through the kingdom of God and parables. So what I did was on our public, on my public page here, Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring, I shared a link to that YouTube playlist. All 20 videos are on that playlist. I'm not going to go over all that again. So we're going to skip from Matthew chapter 12 to, uh, actually we'll cover the end of Matthew chapter 13. Uh, verses 53 through 58. But the rest of that chapter is all the parables. Well, not all of them, but the rest of the the rest of that chapter is uh, Jesus teaching in parables. I'm not going to go over it again. Uh, I don't have anything against the parables, but I've already covered it. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. So we are ready for Matthew chapter 12. Good morning, Mr. Raymond. Good to see you on here today. The first, let's see here, the first 14 verses of Matthew chapter 12 cover two different events that happened on a Sabbath. Of course, the Sabbath day is a major hang-up point for the Pharisees and the scribes in the life of Christ. They really do not like, do not appreciate, I guess I could say, how Jesus dealt with the Sabbath, his activities, and their constant questioning of his authority. And so we're going to talk about that today in these two specific events. It says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Now, of course, this is seen. The Pharisees saw it, and they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. What were they doing? They were plucking heads of grain and eating. Was it unlawful to eat on the Sabbath day? Well, of course not. Um, so they, they really have no argument here. They have nothing against Jesus. If you go back to, I've got it written down here in my Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 24 and 25, you were permitted, if you were passing by a person's field, you were permitted to get whatever, if you were hungry, you could eat. Now, you weren't to go in and harvest the whole field, but you were permitted to eat. You are also permitted to eat on the Sabbath day. Obviously, there was no law against eating or not eating on the Sabbath. They were not breaking a law here. So what Jesus does is he pulls two examples from the Old Testament. He talks about David when he was hungry and he ate the table from the showbread. <laughs> he didn't eat the table. Wow. He ate the showbread from the uh, table. Um 1 Samuel chapter 21, if you want to read that account, you can read the first several verses of 1 Samuel chapter 21. And what you notice here in Matthew chapter 12 is he says, He entered the house of God and ate the showbread. And, and then he says this, and I've got it circled in my Bible, which was not lawful for him to eat. Okay, that bread was reserved for the priesthood, and the Old Testament talks about that. Um, here's the thing. They wouldn't have condemned David for David's actions. David was, again, running for his life. Uh, he was hungry. And uh, the showbread was replaced regularly, the old with fresh, hot bread. Now, again, that bread that was being replaced uh, was for the priest. And so Jesus points out it was not lawful for him to do that. But they would, here's the thing. The Pharisees would not have condemned David for doing what he did. And then he points out the priests who profaned the temple, who rather profaned the Sabbath. How did they profane the Sabbath? Well, they had to offer sacrifices on the Sabbath day. 
That's Numbers chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Yet these hypocritical Pharisees who were condemning, condemning Jesus and his disciples for eating on the Sabbath day, they wouldn't have condemned the priest for doing what they were supposed to do, and they certainly wouldn't have condemned David who did something which was not lawful for him to do. So what Jesus is doing here is he's pointing out the Pharisees' hypocrisy and inconsistencies. Uh, so he says in verse 6, I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Now you, boy, that's, you talk about blasphemy in a, in a Pharisee's mind. Jesus just committed it. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. He is the, Jesus is the guiltless one here. here. His disciples are the guiltless one. Yes, they were passing by a grain field on the Sabbath day, and they, they plucked some ears of grain and they ate. You were permitted to do both of those things. You were permitted to eat on the Sabbath, and you were permitted as you were passing by a neighbor's field to take something if you were hungry, just enough to eat. Uh, but um, the Pharisees were both hypocritical and inconsistent. He says, for the, Lord of, uh, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, he's not saying there in Matthew 12 and verse 8 that, hey, I'm the Lord and I can do whatever I want. It's not what he's saying at all. Rather, he is saying, I know the Sabbath law. Uh, he's the author of it. He is the Word of God, after all. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He knew that he was not in violation of the Sabbath law. He was very much aware, though, of their hypocrisy and inconsistency. Now we have a second incident recorded beginning in verse 9 on a Sabbath. A man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, Jesus, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And here's why they asked him. Verse 10 says that they, might that they might accuse him. They have no compassion. They have no care for the man who has a handicap. You know, he's no, they don't care about him at all. They want to accuse Jesus of something. And so again, he points out their hypocrisy and inconsistency. What man is there among you, okay, among you Pharisees, who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Or how much more value than, uh, of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. They said, then he said to him, to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. It was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Think about that. Now, the first thing to think about is stretch out your hand, and it was restored. Okay, remember the IOU that I gave you. Uh, immediate, observable, and undeniable. They didn't argue against the miracle. They saw what happened. They go out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Why? They didn't want to destroy Jesus because he could heal the sick. They didn't want to destroy Jesus because he so supposedly violated the Sabbath law. They wanted to destroy Jesus because he pointed out their hypocrisy and their inconsistency in their application of the law. And he pointed out here with this second miracle, or rather with this miracle, that, um, that they lacked compassion. That's why they wanted to destroy Jesus. Something to think about, isn't it? Their reaction to him. i got several comments here. Connie says she ordered that book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Very interesting book. And very helpful. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning, Derek. Glad to see all you on here. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, well, knew what? They're plotting against him. They want to kill him. He withdrew from there. I find it very interesting there in verse 15. Again, Jesus is not seeking out persecution. Jesus is not trying to become a martyr. Again, you know, Paul, when he was first converted to Christ, you read Acts chapter 9. Uh, he, he began boldly preaching that Jesus is the Christ, and people started seeking his life. Well, what did he do? He got out of town. He didn't seek martyrdom. He didn't seek persecution. Here's the thing. If, I, if I'm living a faithful Christian life, I'm told that I will suffer persecution. But I don't go out every day looking for it. You know, I don't go out looking for trouble. I can be wise as a serpent, serpent and harmless as a dove as Jesus taught his disciples back in Matthew chapter 10. So he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them, look at this three-letter word, three word, all. He healed them all, not just a few. Yet he warned them not to make him known. Why? That it might be fulfilled, 
which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. This is prophecy number 10 that is specifically cited in Matthew's gospel account and referred to either Jesus. The, uh, so nine of the ten refer to Jesus. One of them refers to John the baptizer that we've looked at so far. Prophecy number 10, and Matthew here quotes Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4, talking about Jesus' character. Notice it says, um, just for instance, in verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. This is talking about Jesus' manner of operation. This is talking about how Jesus conducted himself among the people. He, uh, verse 19, he will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He's not, Jesus is not doing what he did to make a public display of himself. He's not out seeking attention. I've talked about, I, I, I forget, it seems like it was, either earlier this week or last week, where I talked about there was a group in Pensacola who would stand on street corners like once a month, and they'd have big signs, and they would, if you know, once it was a red light, they'd, boy, they'd come right up to your car, and they'd just be yelling at you. You need to repent, you sinner. Jesus didn't operate like that. That was not his mission. That doesn't draw people to you. Now, that draws attention to yourself, but that's not what Jesus' method was. That was not his purpose. And so that's what these verses mean, and that's what the prophecy of Isaiah 42 was talking about. And he has a completely different method than the Pharisees had. Remember back in the Sermon on the Mount, um, let's see, the first part of Matthew chapter 6, he talked about when you pray, enter into your closet. Don't go on the street corners like the hypocrites do. Don't make a public display of what you're trying to do. Jesus himself didn't even do that. Pointing out their hypocrisy and their inconsistency. Now we have another miracle being performed, starting in verse 22, Matthew chapter 12. One brought to him with a, uh, who, uh, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute both spoke and saw. Now notice what happens here. The multitude saw this. Again, his miracles are observable. They're undeniable. There's no question that what he is doing is miraculous. And... Uh, he, even the, even the Pharisees, his enemies, saw it. They couldn't deny it. That's the true nature of miracles. Now the Pharisees heard it. Verse 24, This fellow, Jesus, they're referring to, does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Think about that charge and what you read in the rest of this section here. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, because that's the charge they're making against him. He just cast out demons, and he healed a blind and mute. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. That is, it's right in your midst. It's right here in front of you, and you can't even see it. Obviously, Jesus was not casting out demons uh, in the name of the prince of demons, but by the Spirit of God as he says there in verse 28. And that's another that brings another verse to mind. If you write in the margins of your Bibles, um, right next to verse 28, write down this verse, Acts 10, and uh, you can write down verses 36 through 38, but listen to Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. That's a Matthew 12 uh, verses. What verses 22 through 30 are a perfect commentary on Acts chapter 10 and verse 36, or rather verse 38. Jesus is not casting out demons in the name of demons, in the name of Beelzebub, and it's in this context that we have what's called the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. This is Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. If you blaspheme against the Son of Man, it can be forgiven. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. So let me say this at the outset of this discussion. This is a miraculous context. Jesus had just healed a demon-possessed man. 
None of us can do that today. That power is not available today because, number one, there are no apostles on earth to perform those miracles. Number two, there are no apostles on earth who have the ability to pass on the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not it, So this, this cannot happen today. Men cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit like this today. Now, men can blaspheme the Holy Spirit today in a different way. See, you and I, when we sit down and re- we, we read the Bible, we are reading the sword of the Spirit. Okay, Ephesians 6 and verse 17. <clears throat> so if we speak out against the Word of God, if we deny the Word of God, if we disobey it, etc., we are, in a sense, blaspheming or speaking out against the Holy Spirit Himself because the, the Bible is the product of the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's, I guess that's a whole other subject to cover in another video. But in a sense, you and I can blaspheme the Holy Spirit today, but not in this miraculous way. And then what he says in verses 33 through 37 is, um, there's good trees and there's bad trees. There's good fruit and bad fruit. Well, the Pharisees are that brood of vipers, verse 34, are evil. Because they are they're attributing a miracle that Jesus just performed to Satan himself. And again, it's not because they are concerned about Jesus. It's not because they were concerned about the demon-possessed man. It's because they hate Jesus. They were evil. And so verses 36 and 37, For every idle word that men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Again, that's a day that has not occurred yet. These Pharisees have not stood before him in judgment yet to give an account of these idle words that they spoke when they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by beals above the ruler of the demons. Matthew 12 and verse 24. There's a lot, you know, there are a lot of, I guess there are a lot of different principles, a lot of different applications that we could use Matthew 12 verses 36 and 37 for. And I've, I've done that myself. You know, I've connected Matthew 12 verses uh, 36 through 37 with uh, James chapter 3 where James in the first, what is it, first 12 verses of James 3 talks about the abuse of the tongue and how it's a, an unruly thing that, can't, that has not been tamed. But contextually, we're dealing with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the Pharisees witnessing a miracle, a demon-possessed man being healed, and saying he is casting out demons by the prince of demons. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in this context. In that, in that way, that sin cannot be committed today. In the, the, <laughs> the lack of self-awareness here is amazing to me. Because we move on to verse 38. It says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answering said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Well, what in the world had just happened? I mean, think about it. We want to see a sign from you. All right, well... You go back up to verse uh, 9 and 10. He's healed a man with a withered hand. There's a sign for you. You go down to verses 22 through 23. He's healed a demon-possessed man who is blind and mute. There's a sign for you. And then he rebukes them, again, for their hypocrisy, for their inconsistencies, for their uh, uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And then they say, say, we want to see a sign from you. And what is his response? No sign will be given. They've already rejected all the other signs. So what's one more going to do? What good would healing another person do for them? It's not going to convince them that he is the Christ. Although it should have. I mean, the evidence is there. The evidence is abundant. He says, i tell you what. I'll give you a sign. It's going to be the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We know what that's referring to. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's not hard to understand. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. He's greater than Jonah. He talks about the queen of the south. This is 1 Kings chapter 10, uh, an event during the life of Solomon. She's going to rise up in judgment and condemn this generation. Uh, for she came to the, from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. She wanted to hear what Solomon had to say. These people have access to the Son of God. 
and they want to kill him. Uh, they're not interested. Another sign is not, gonna, not going to convince them. So the, that's what I said, looking at verse 38, their, their lack of self-awareness, their lack of their surroundings, what's going on, what they've already seen, and then what they're asking for is just, it's astounding to see their willful ignorance and their hatred of Jesus here. That's what this is all about. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. What Jesus is doing here in verses 43 through 45 is he is describing the spiritual condition of these people who have just said, hey, we want to see a sign. He goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. You Pharisees, this I'm describing you. That's what he's saying here in verses 43 through 45. They were bad. Jesus comes on the scene. He shows them their badness, their wickedness, their inconsistency, their hypocrisies. He teaches the truth. They reject the truth. And then they're back here asking for another sign. It's amazing to see their condition and their, their lack of awareness of their condition. You know, it's one thing to be fooled. It's one thing to be deceived. It's a whole other ballgame to be self-deceived. And that's what these guys were. Well, while he's talking, behold, his mother, talking to the multitudes, his mother, his brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. One said, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside. Uh, Mary had other children. There are multiple passages that prove that, but some people deny it. Again, that's a lack of self-awareness and a lack of knowledge of Scripture. Your mothers and brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you, but he answered, and I love his answer here, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Who is it that I have a relationship with? It's not, it's not just be, we, we're not right with God just because we're related to somebody. Um, our physical family, sure, they're our physical family, but our true family, just like with Jesus, the Christian's true family is that which obeys the will of God. It's not just about blood relationship. Remember what uh, uh, John the Baptizer came on the scene preaching. Don't think to say to yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For God can from these stones raise up children to Abraham. That, that's out the window. That doesn't matter. What matters is, are we doing the will of God? That's what puts us in a right relationship with Jesus. That's what puts us in a right relationship with God. And incidentally, that's what puts us in a right relationship with one another. You know, that goes back to, in the, you remember in the limited commission, uh, back in Matthew chapter 10, um, well, I'll just start in verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It's not about that. It's about, am I doing the will of God? Well, he teaches his audience that, the multitudes, as it says there in Matthew 12 and verse 46. This applies to everybody. God, you know, God doesn't care what your last name is. God doesn't care who you're related to. It's about doing the will of the Father. All right, I know there's a lot there in Matthew chapter 12. Hopefully I've opened some doors for you in further study. If you have any questions or comments, send them to me. Put them here in the comment section. Let me look here real quick before I wrap it up. Debbie says, it is easy to get upset with everything that is going on nowadays. I stand strong for what I believe is good and right. I also feel that we have to turn some things over to God, but He still expects us to do what's right. Yeah, you know, Debbie, we don't, we, we can't control what's going on in the world. The only thing that I can control is myself. I can control my response to what's going on in the world. But you know, I can't go out and fight some great war on what? Environmentalism. Okay, I, I can't change the world's view on that. I have no control over that, but I do have control over myself and how I behave and what I say and what I do. And that's kind of what the end of Matthew chapter 12 teaches us too. All right, guys, thanks for watching today. I appreciate your compliments. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Gene. Appreciate you being on here today. 
Uh, tomorrow's Friday, so I probably won't be here. Our services will be live streamed here for Mammoth Spring at 10 o'clock this Sunday after, not afternoon, 10 o'clock is not afternoon, this Sunday at 10 o'clock, that's what I'll say. Um, and then we'll be back, I won't be back Monday, let me think about that, I've got a doctor's appointment Monday morning, so I won't be here Monday, I'll be back here Tuesday. And remember, we're not going to go back through the parables, I've already done that recently, and I put a link on our public page here for that playlist from our YouTube channel. So I'll plan on seeing you back here in my office Tuesday at 11 o'clock, and we'll start at the end of Matthew chapter 13. Until then, I hope you have a good day and a good rest of this week, and I look forward to seeing you back here on our studies Tuesday morning. Have a good day.